Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Silver Savage Podcast. I'm actually at my studio for a change, uh, which would make for a better uh, sound quality and image quality and hopefully less uh, ambient noise of cars driving next to my camper and so forth. So super excited about all of you being here with me. A few quick things before I get into today's topic. Uh, first of all, our website that's been up for a while, but actually it's been updated uh, is up in live, so go ahead and check it out, silversavage.com, and you're going to see all the uh, Power Podcast episodes on it, you're going to see some swag, we have some new shirts on, um, I should have been wearing one today, I didn't, I apologize, um, I'll wear it in the future, uh, some cool designs, um, and obviously uh, our regular swag in terms of our um, pen bomb and our inhalers, all there, so you can buy it all, so go ahead, check it out. Uh, check the content and certainly uh, try to support us if you can. Also, as we move forward and start creating Silver Savage events, uh, you're going to see those posted as well. Our coaching program membership is also going to be linked to it. So if you're interested in that, you can go ahead and check that out. Uh, a lot of the events are going to be closed for coaching members only, uh, but some of them are going to be open for the whole community. So with that aside today's topic a little bit different we're going to talk about terrorism so a little bit more current events a little less skill sets uh skill set specific this is the thing when i look at the statistics of the podcast that we dropped the ones where i talk and discuss current events such as the war in israel and so forth in average gets about 10 times as much listeners downloads and views uh so tells me that that is something that you guys are interested in. I am, though, going to tie it to the Sil Silver Savage skills so we're not completely leaving the realm because at the end of the day, I created this podcast to give us all tools and skills that we can implement. Uh, but maybe discussing terrorism is going to put it in context as to why those skills are important. Um, so with no further ado, let's get into the episode. So this is it. As I mentioned, this is what we train for, right? At the end of the day, everything that we do a Silver Savage community is about protecting what matters, right? You hear me say that a lot. And protecting what matters may mean your family, may mean your friends, your community, your business, yourself. But what are we protecting from? And threats come in a variety of ways, and one of which can be terrorism. This actually came up in a conversation recently that I had with the publisher of my next book, uh, if you follow our social media, you've seen me mention it. I'm going to have more information about the book in the near future. Uh, it is still being written and edited and so forth, but I'm super excited to have that out. But one of the topics in the book, or the very last chapter, bringing a lot of things together, was my recent deployment to Israel, kind of supporting the war efforts against Hamas over there. And the question came... What do you think about terrorism in America? Do you think that's going to happen? Is that a possibility? To what extent? How is it going to happen, manifest itself, and so forth? And the question is certainly, uh, it's not a question whether it's going to be coming here. It's already here. We tend to forget events such as 9-11, 20-some years later. But the reality is that terrorism has been here for a while. Let's start by defining terrorism. There are a few variations to the definition, depending on which government agency you follow. But as a general rule, I think pretty much everybody agrees on the fact that it is the use of violence or the threat of using violence against non-combatants. And this is important, so it's not against military or law enforcement, because that would be considered an act of war. So it's against non-combatants to affect a political agenda. So if we put it in the context of the events of October 7th in Israel, that was a group of people that was trying to affect a political agenda using violence against civilians uh, to that extent. So that is straight out terrorism. These are not freedom fighters. Uh, if they were freedom fighters, they would be attacking military only. But the second you went after babies, you went after elderly people, civilians in their home. It is no longer an act of war or freedom fighting. This is straight out terrorism. Now, does it have to be Islamist terrorism? No. Terrorism can be any political agenda. So for sake of argument, PETA, as the organization that values animal rights, is a terror organization because they use violence against non-combatants to affect a political agenda. Them walking around and throwing paint on people wearing fur coats or attacking them on the street, that is terrorism. There is a variety of terrorism. It can be based on nationalism, can be based on religion, can be based on an ideology. 
and certainly Islamist terrorism falls in there. And for today's purpose, I'm going to concentrate on Islamist terrorism. But just keep in mind as we go for this discussion that it does not have to be strictly Islamist terrorism. Now, years ago, I, uh, I shared this statistic. This is something that's been um, shared uh, with me by people that I know in Homeland Security. This is open source intelligence. Uh, by now, this is not anything classified that I'm sharing with you. And the statistics simply said that to the best of our knowledge, because there are no accurate numbers, but to the best of our knowledge, there are more terrorists now in the United States than there are, for example, in South Lebanon, which is an area in the Middle East that we would typically consider and perceive as one that's high in terrorists, but actually we have more of them here. And I always say when I think about the illegal immigration coming over the southern border with Mexico, I'm not concerned about the Mexicans, right? I'm not concerned about the people that are just trying to better their lives because they're running away from poverty and they want to chase the American dream. I can relate to that as an immigrant myself. I wish they went through the legal process like I did, but I don't fear them. That is not the concern I have. The concern I have is knowing for a fact that the majority of people, well, I'm not, I'm exaggerating, maybe not the majority, I don't have the exact number, but a vast number of the people that are crossing that border are not just innocent immigrants. They are in fact terrorists that figure out, okay, I cannot get into the United States through the natural or the normal channels, just taking a flight and going for the immigration process. It's a lot easier cheaper to just come with all these immigrants through the southern border and call it a day. So we know that there is a vast majority or vast number of terrorists in here. With that um, statistics, these uh, agents that I was talking to at the time also shared with me some enlightening pictures. And they, these pictures were of tents on the American side of the southern uh, border with Mexico. So these are on our side already. Um, and in these tents, you would expect to see whatever items are related to Mexican immigrants, but in actuality, what was in those tents were praying rugs, were Qurans, were manifestos about uh, uh, Islamist agendas. So we know that those people that are coming through are not strictly Mexicans. Um, and I'll, I'll add one more. When we talk about the tunnels that are being built from the southern border into America, where do you think the know-how and the technology to make those, to build those, to dig those comes from? It's the Middle East. I mean, they've been doing it for decades in the Middle East, and all we're doing right now is sharing that knowledge and that intelligence, and by we, I mean the terrorists, with the Mexican cartel counter counterparts, because at the end of the day, we'll advance their agenda as well, facilitates their way into this country. So everything that we're seeing happening in the southern border is very much a result or certainly related and connected to what's going on in the Middle East. Um, I'm sure most of you have seen the movie Sicario 1, Sicario 2. I can't wait for Sicario 3 because there's got to be if you saw Sicario 2 and you know it ended. But I like referring to the opening scene of Sicario 2 because that is, in my mind, as realistic of a representation of what may happen as any other. If you haven't seen, it starts by... Customs and Border Protection closing in on some of those tents on the American uh, side of the border with Mexico. And as they approach these tents where we have these, in theory, illegal immigrants, but in reality, terrorists, um, as they close on them, these terrorists blow themselves up and kill a bunch of these Customs and Border Protection. The scene then continues by showing three of those terrorists that came in illegally walking into a convenience store, uh, a Walmart type place, and blowing themselves up in that convenience store, killing a bunch of civilians. So that's a movie. But is that realistic and could that happen? And in my mind, 100%. If we follow history, and we don't have to go too far back, just look at Israel two months ago, three months ago, and you'll see what they can accomplish and do. Because at the end of the day, they have the resources, they have the time, they have the money, they have the know-how, and there's nothing that's truly stopping them because our intelligence entities, right, our intelligence departments and, and uh, agencies, sorry, that's the word I was looking for, and our law enforcement agencies are incapable of catching up. And that, that's the reality. A clandestine operation, like the ones they are running, uh, they're very effective at it. 
so they can accumulate a lot of the gear that they need and train people uh, without the Americans or in Israel's um, case, the Israeli intelligence being able to actually catch up to them, right? So this is very likely to happen. Now, this is my thing. When people ask me, what do you think is going to happen in America? And just so we understand, I do not work for an intelligence agency. I work part time as a law enforcement agency, and that's a very small part time. Uh, but my academic background is in counterterrorism and international security from undergrad to my graduate degree. Um, and I do come from a background of fighting terrorism in my own country. So this is my educated guess, if you will. Take it for what it's worth. Make your own conclusions based on the information you know. I don't foresee another 9-11 type attack happening. The reality is that we learn from it, right? We have a tendency to learn from history, and that's a good tendency. Unfortunately, it stops there, and we don't project to the future what hasn't happened historically yet, and we'll talk about it in a minute. But we train for 9-11 type attacks, so our cockpits are not reinforced, we have pilots carrying guns, we have air marshals on flight, we do a better job at screening, whether you like DSA or not like DSA, it's another layer of deterrent, and the reality is that we are not likely to see another event like that happening. What I do think is going to happen is very much like Sicario 2 uh, predicted or represented is the idea that we're going to have an attack on a small town in America um, in the sense of a small terrorism cell attacking it. And I say small terrorism cell because the way I perceive terror networks and organization right now, it is not like it used to be where you had one major terror organization and a few offshoots and they were all directed the same manner. That was the way of the past of the 60s and 70s and maybe the 80s. But now what we have is a shitload of independent cells that may share an agenda and may share a little bit of resources loosely, but the reality is they are very independent and self-driven. So for the most part, those are smaller cells. So an attack like we saw Hamas do in October in Israel or an event like 9-11, um, I don't think we're going to see anything uh, like that in America necessarily. But I do see a small group of people going into a Walmart in small town, town America and blowing themselves up. And why do I say small town, town America and not a big city like Baltimore, New York, you know, Los Angeles or anything like that? First of all, we're expecting those. I would argue that the law enforcement agencies, intelligence agencies, that oftentimes have offices in those big cities are better prepared, they're training for it, they're on top of the intelligence report and their informants and so forth. So we are arguably more protected in those larger cities than we are in the smaller ones. Uh, so the, lo the smaller cities, the smaller towns are obviously less prepared and the smaller the town, the less prepared it becomes. Because if you go to some of these towns that have one police officer working, right, over a huge amount of territorial area because it's all agricultural fields, then you can see the challenges that an individual like that as a law enforcement officer would have to stay on top of terrorism when he has all this other BS on a daily basis that he has to deal with. The other thing is there's, in my mind, a larger psychological impact. The, the reality is that we expect it to happen in New York. We expect it to happen in DC. We expect it to happen in Los Angeles, you know, Dallas or whatever. We don't expect it to happen in a small little town in the middle of, I don't know, Kansas, right? If that happens and they can get us there, then that drives the message that they can get us anywhere. And that is really a big psychological effect that I think they can gain out of it. And as a result of the terrorism incident, I foresee also an economic cascade, an economic collapse cascade. And what I mean by that is, if we believe that we are unsafe, even in a small town in America, and we're afraid of, let's say, sending our kids to school because there are terrorists are trying to blow themselves up or shoot or do whatever. If I don't send my kids to school, that means that a parent has to stay home with them. That means that parent is not going to work. That means that economy is not going to start feeling the effects of the resources depleting, including manpower, and that in turn, may lead to a complete economic collapse over time, right? I mean, when you think about guerrilla warfare, we think about how nations, the U.S. included, tries to affect 
political outcomes in other countries. We do it oftentimes, but small little steps that would affect the economy, that would lead people in a certain direction, and that's typically how we topple governments. So terrorists are just as smart as we are, and they can do the same exact thing. So what would I think would, ha would happen? If I don't think that 9-11 uh, type attack would happen again, um, what, what are they going to do? So knowing terrorism, I, I'd say the first thing is that there are no absolute. They can do absolutely anything, anything from explosive, and it can be people born or vehicle born, right, to ramming of vehicles. Uh, we see a lot of attacks uh, across the world, and even in America, where people with a car are ramming, ramming through a crowd. That is terrorism. That is using violence, using a car as a weapon to, uh, to kill a lot of people, to injure a lot of people, to deliver a political agenda. So that may happen. We obviously can be sh see uh, shootings and stabbings as well. But what I don't want to do, and this is going back to we learn from 9-11, but we don't forecast to the future, is that most of us tend to get those blinds on and we train only to what we know happened. But we don't try to sit down and think outside the box, put ourselves in the mind of a terrorist and say, okay, what is new? What has not been done before? What is something that law enforcement and intelligence agencies are not looking for or planning for at the moment. So I certainly want to start thinking outside the box. Now, not to say that our intelligence law enforcement agencies have not been thinking about it, but things such as contaminating water sources, contaminating some of our food sources, right? Excuse me. <coughs> Still overcoming that cold. Um, cyber attacks against infrastructure, right? We remember a few years back, a uh, power outage in New York City, and now that completely shut down and created all kind of chaos and panic. So can you imagine that happening more and more frequent and in different parts of the country and what kind of effect that would have on people? Uh, think biological agents, right? We haven't seen a big use of it, uh, at least not domestically, but uh, certainly a possibility. And I'll give you an example. We were running uh, a drill at a large uh, hospital probably 15 years ago. And... The, the drill call for an active assailant. Now, the nice thing that, uh, in my mind that I like to do is assailant wasn't defined, right? It wasn't an active shooter per se. So as a general definition of an active assailant, it's anything that can kill you or cause severe bodily harm. Now, we tend to think of shootings because that's what we hear about in the news, but it doesn't have to be. Somebody with a baseball bat walking around hitting people is an active assailant. Somebody stabbing multiple people is an active assailant. So in this specific case, I decided to play outside the box. Now, mind you, we invited a variety of law enforcement agencies from state police to local agencies, including the organization's own security force. Uh, so they were all there. We had role players and so forth. And the little change that I made to the drill was the assailant did not have a gun. They had a syringe that they said contained Ebola virus. Now, the funny thing that happened is law enforcement officers that were staged outside expecting in their mind to come to an active shooter drill now are being told the intelligence says that the attacker has a syringe and if that syringe falls and breaks or if he finds another way to disperse that virus then you know it's it's chaos and none of these police officers wanted to go in these police officers essentially said we don't have the equipment or the gear to deal with a biological type attack. So just by changing a small element, all of a sudden it, it put all these agencies in the spot of, I don't know what to do. And that is a challenge. And that is the way we have to start thinking about terrorism. What is something that they are possibly considering that we haven't trained or planned for yet? I'll throw one more of you. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the term complex coordinated attack. A complex coordinated attack would be multiple events going on simultaneously using typically more sophisticated type of weaponry, uh, which really depletes the response options of local law enforcement. So as examples, think of the attacks in Mumbai, India, uh, think of the attacks in Paris, France, 9-11, uh, because we have multiple events going on in different places. Uh, those are all complex coordinated attack. Now it's something that we know is gonna gain popularity in a sense. Uh, it's something that it's hard for us as first responders to address. 
yet I don't know of any agency, a true agency, that runs a true uh, response to a complex coordinated attack trail or event. So a lot of them may have discussions or some tabletops maybe about sharing incident commands and between EMS and fire and police and maybe a hospital. But the reality is I have not seen a full scale drill take place uh, to address those events. So what do you think is going to happen when we have a complex coordinated attack? And I'll give you an example. When we had the shooting at the Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas, although that was one shooter using a rifle from one hotel, the way the calls came up on dispatch, and if you ever have the opportunity to listen to a debrief, or I'm sure you can find it online as well, it came up as a few different events going on at a few different locations, from the Tropicana to where the concert was taking place to a few other locations around the city. Response was depleted. EMS did not get to the injured people in time. A lot of them ended up self-extricating themselves. We had no way as first responders of truly addressing the threat because information was all mixed up and all these entities that in theory are supposed to work together were unable to. So just something to think about because guess what? I'm sure the terrorists are. So are we as responders trying to met, uh, meet that and match that? So what can you do, right? Terrorism is a bitch and it's coming and we know it's coming. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when and is it happening next week or is it happening next year or in the next five years? It is happening. So what can you do to be prepared? So first thing is stay vigilant, right? We always say that being proactive is more important than being reactive. So if I can see things unfolding in a certain manner, I want to start taking steps to address it. So being aware of suspicious behavior. Let's define that real quickly. Suspicious behavior is anything that is outside the norm, right? Now, mind you, I don't base it on race or religion or sexual orientation or anything like that. It's strictly on behavior. So if I expect a certain behavior in my neighborhood, I know the mail comes at a certain time and a certain Amazon and UPS driver and my neighbors drive certain cars and so forth. And once in a while, I see a car that doesn't seem to fit the area. Am I going to be a little more alert? 100%, right? So this is what you guys have to start doing. You guys have to start picking up on patterns around your daily life, where you live, where you work, where your kids go to school and start picking up on any anomalies or anything that doesn't fit that norm. That would be suspicious. Now, not to say that every suspicious behavior is necessarily a terrorism threat, but it certainly warrants me investigating a little more. And what we as civilians, specifically in the Western modern world, what we learn to do is ignore those signs, right? We kind of got very comfortable and we're like, okay, we'll trust police to do their job. And we started ignoring those signs. Now, those little hairs on the back of your neck rising are prehistoric programming that our body has to warn us from a threat. And when we ignore that, we're putting ourselves at risk. So if you ever feel that, just take a second and figure out, why am I feeling off? Why is why are those hairs on the back of my neck rising? Why am I on edge right now? And try to investigate and figure that out. It may be nothing. It may be something. And would you rather be wrong and it be nothing? Or would you rather be right and not do anything about it because you were too chicken shit to do so, right? So certainly be aware of any suspicious behavior. Stop playing the political correct game, right? This is another problem we got too. Using another example, the Mandalay, uh, not the Mandalay Bay, sorry, the, uh, oh, I forgot the name, uh, San Bernardino. San Bernardino shooting, it was a holiday party. It was a couple went in, shot, I believe, 12 people at the time. After the event happened, a neighbor came out to police and said, listen, something was off about that house. People coming in and out all kind of day and night. You know, it wasn't normal, but I didn't want to call it in because I didn't want to be that Islamophobe guy. And by trying to play the political correct king, he essentially aided these terrorists in killing 12 people. So... Don't play that game. As I said, I'd rather you be wrong 99% of the time than be right once but not do anything about it. So take take the opportunity again, investigate if something doesn't feel right, get the authorities involved, let them investigate if needs be, and, uh, and keep everybody safe, including yourself. Prepare your infrastructure, right? The whole idea is hardening yourself as a target. One way for me to not be a victim of terrorism is deter those terrorists from coming to where I'm at and potentially going somewhere else, right? 
So if I am, if I have a house that's better secure, if I have the image at least of being less of an attractive as a target, I am making it harder for that terrorist to come. And that terrorist is very likely going to go somewhere else. He goes not just for my house, obviously, but for my organization, my company, um, my kids' school, everything like that. Think about setting up your house or your workplace for success in terms of having generators in place. Remember, we talk about that infrastructure, potential hacking attack, right? Uh, backup supplies from food to water to chemical toilets. Okay, nothing worse than having to go to the bathroom and not having a way to do so. And over time, that's going to get pretty nasty, not to mention a hygiene problem. Uh, reinforcing your doors and windows. Security landscaping is a big one that I like. If you live in a single family home, putting some thorny bushes around the house certainly would deter potential attackers from going in there. Have a plan. Does your family know what to do if an event happens? Do you anchor at home or do you go to a different location? Depends on where you live. Depends on what time of day that happens. I live on a peninsula. For me to get out, if there's an attack, may be cumbersome. It may be safer for me to stay where I'm at. Or it may be safer for me to commandeer a boat and do it via water. So the idea is that I need to have a plan and have, to have contingency plans depending on the type of event that I'm dealing with. And then I have to rehearse that plan. Because having a plan, is, a plan is dandy and not nice, but the reality is that if I did not rehearse it, at least superficially, and I don't know what to do. The, the statement that I always said, under stress, under duress, we don't rise to the occasion. We fall down to a level of training. So if I never practice for that, I'm very likely not gonna be successful in executing that plan. So certainly go ahead, come up with some plans and rehearse that plan. Build a tribe and a community of people that you can work with and that you trust. So have some friends, ideally friends with some skills, can be medically trained, they can be uh, mechanics. Mechanics are great, you gotta have mechanics because they make all kinds of shit work, right? People that know to garden, have the tribe of people with you and if something happens, you all have a unification area, you all know where to meet, you all know what each person brings, you all know where you're gonna go and you can take it from there. So come up with a plan and involve that tribe and rehearse it with that tribe. Learn some skills. We always say, this is what the podcast is all about. What it's been from the beginning is making ourselves better savages, better warriors, so we can protect who needs to be protected, right? From our family, to community, to ourselves, as we said. So did you learn some skills? Did you learn some medical skills? Did you learn self-defense? Did you know how to shoot? Did you stay in shape? I can't even remember how many times we harped on that in this podcast. But if something happens, terrorism happens, are you a liability or are you an asset? Are you in shape or are you not? Are you going to fall apart or are you going to be able to help your loved ones? So certainly invest in some skills and your own abilities. And lastly, stay informed. Okay, Don't ignore what's going on out there. Okay, Check the news from time to time. I know it's depressing and I try not to do it often, but stay informed. Okay, And stay informed from the right sources. Our media nowadays is skewed in all kinds of directions. I don't care if you're right-leaning or left-leaning. You know, whatever you're being fed is already curated to meet the agenda that those media channels want to drive. So be careful on where you get it, validate everything, but certainly stay informed, know what's going on, learn a little bit more about terrorism, learn a little bit more about ways to protect yourself from terrorism. And ultimately, the more you know, knowledge is power, the more you know, the more informed you are, the safer you're likely going to be. So I hope you find this podcast uh, helpful. Hopefully uh, you are not a victim of terrorism. I wanted to say hopefully uh, it doesn't happen, but unfortunately I, I do believe that it is going to happen. Uh, so I just hope that you guys are safe. And if I can provide you with a tool or skill or something to, to drive some thinking to make you a little bit safer than we did our job. So in the meantime, go check your plans, check your house, Talk to your family, see what you're going to do if and when things happen. And until next time, stay savage.